Trial Lawyers University, where the Titans come to train. Produced and powered by Law Pods. So we have Dave Christensen here from Southfield, Michigan, and the Christensen Law Firm, which is which is where I'm from. And I've known Dave in passing and a little bit for many years, but in recent times got to know each other a little bit better through um, collaborating on some work. So that was a you know that was really great for me. But Dave. Let me let me ask you, Dave. Can you, um, for everybody that doesn't know you who may not be from Michigan, can you give us a little bit? You know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Ah, sure, Dan. Um, well, I'm. Uh, we run a personal injury law firm in Southfield. We have eight to eight trial attorneys, um, and we opened up this firm almost ten years ago. And before that, I practiced for like twenty two years in a in another law firm where I really learned how to do this. And, but I've been practicing 32 years. Now, I did a lot before I, I came to the law late. So I did quite a lot before that. I had a ton of jobs and I never held one, even one year. Really? So I only had, I think I was a house planner for 20 years. I worked as a grocery store clerk for a week when I was about 10 years old. But the guy who owned it kept calling me, boy, come here, boy. And I was like, that's hurting my self image. I don't think I want to work anymore. And I worked at a mortgage company for like a week. And then I realized it seemed like kind of like a shady operation. So that was it. Other than that, I was, uh, well, I was a house planner, but I had my own company for like those 20 years. But other than that, being a lawyer, that's the extent for my professional career. But your professional career. So you said you had a lot of different jobs. Tell us about some of those jobs. Yeah. So you held one for 20 years, even though it was working for yourself. I didn't. I got fired from pretty much every job that I had. Uh, construction. Wait, hold on, hold on a second. You got fired? Oh, so yeah. You quit. So how'd you, tell us what are your more favorite, your memorable getting fired experiences. I held a job as a busboy for one night. I'd grown my hair long for four years. And <laughs> oh, I had to get a job. And so I cut my hair. I had tickets to Led Zeppelin and I gave them away and my best friend took my girlfriend to the concert so that I could go start this job as a busboy. And uh, we had kind of a long day at the beach that day, and I probably shouldn't have done that. And I ended up to go into work that night. And I, let's just say I was not desirable. I was not a desirable busboy. And I was sent home after about 45 minutes. That was my most uh, shortest job. That was the shortest job. I had a job at 10 years old working at a produce stand alongside the road. I grew up in Southern California, so these are common sites. And I was in fourth grade. The school bus would drop me off three days a week. And I worked at the stand for 50 cents an hour. And when I got paid one week, I challenged the guy, Earl Carraway was his name, because I thought he shorted me a quarter. And apparently he disagreed because when I came in the next day, they told me they didn't need me anymore. So that was my first official firing. I, the, first of many, the first of many. Well, yeah. so you grew up in California, but decided to move to Michigan. Uh, yeah, I came to Michigan. From Michigan. And then I moved to California, but now I'm in Vegas. So what was it that, how'd you get to Michigan? Oh, I uh, came to Michigan to go to graduate school. And uh, we moved to Michigan uh, my wife and I, Leslie, uh, we, we got married in 1983 and moved to Michigan so that I could go to grad school. And I finished grad school, but just never left. So you went to the University of Michigan Law School? I did. I went to the University of Michigan Law School. But what originally brought us out there was I came to a Chinese studies program to do a master's degree in Chinese studies. And they have a really good center for Chinese studies. And... Uh, so I moved out there for that. And then it was a few years later, I went to law school. I was about 30 when I went to law school. All right, because I went to the University of Michigan also, but undergraduate. I'm not intellectually gifted enough to go to their prestigious law school, just an undergrad. And yeah. silly enough, I was a Japanese major for the first three years. No what kidding. a crazy decision that was. I mean, 
And I think the real reason people, why did you do that? And like, well, there was this really cute girl in line that I didn't know what my major was going to be. She was a Japanese major. I said, you know what? I'll get to know her. That was a bad decision on my part, but I've gotten better <laughs> judgment since then. <laughs> better judgment since then. And, you know, and, for, and like I was in Michigan until I was 45. So I was quite glad to move away from the people like, don't you miss the change of seasons? I'm like, not even this much. Yes. I don't miss snow. I don't miss overcast, cloudy, rainy skies and flat land. Not even a little bit. Not even a little bit. So, okay. So, bus boy, um, bus carpet boy. cleaner, carpet cleaner. Yeah. Construction laborer, um, gas station attendant when you used to have full serve, uh, gas station, uh, sound mixer and a bar. Um, well, that's a great diversity of, uh, careers. Yeah. How do you think having, which one of those careers, which one of those jobs do you think helped you the most? in what you're doing today and being a trial lawyer? Well, who didn't work for a mortgage company? I think everybody has done that. And that, uh, for me, I, I think, you know, I, I did that when you had to go out and actually sell yourself to real estate agents to get business. And this was in the eighties, there was a recession, there was inflation, the rates were up and down and up to 18%. It was crazy time. And, uh, and, so we had to go out and become salespeople. And, and that just involved establishing relationships with people. And I think I got pretty good at that and pretty natural for me. And um, I think that's the, the trait that I have that probably helps me the most. All right. Well, speaking of traits and characters and qualities, what do you, would you say if somebody said, Dave, what do you think the top three qualities or character traits of a winning or a great trial lawyer are, trial lawyer are what would you say? Wow. Well, there's so many great trial lawyers that all do it very differently. That's the funny thing. Um, so I think what I believe is credibility, right? Your word has to be gold. And that has to uh, start when you first open your mouth in a case. Um, and I don't mean at trial. I mean, when you start the case and throughout the case. Um, right. Even meeting with your client. I mean, having credibility with your client, because if you don't have a lot of credibility, they're not going to listen to you. And, and, you know, when it comes to accepting offers or what you think the case is worth. And you yeah. have, hear so many stories from lawyers about their clients going sideways on them or their clients, you know, won't listen to them. Or they had a million dollar you know, offer and they went to, you got verdict and got 200,000 and how peeved they are and, and how they beg their client to take it, but they wouldn't. But, you know, if you if you have that connection, that credibility with your client, they're going to listen to you because look, what the hell do they know, honestly? And you're looking out for their best interest. But when you don't, they just think it's you against, it's them against you and the world and the defense. And that's a hard way to. You know, it, it is. And I, I think people with high character, it, it shines through right? It isn't something, I mean, yeah, we, you try to do that, uh, every day and, but it isn't something you can go in and just put on for a few days in front of a jury. I mean, it, this is a matter of how we conduct ourselves throughout the day. Right. I think that just shines through and, uh, the jury, you know, the jury is being offered competing stories. Which one are they going to believe? They're going to believe the most believable storyteller. That's and the true. witness, then the evidence. But so I think I think credibility is super important. I think the diligence. Um, I, I don't use the, maybe perseverance is a better word than diligence. What do you, well, I think uh, what, what I'm talking about is the kind of diligence where you are the most prepared lawyer in the room. You have read every word on all those documents, you've looked at all of them and you know them better than your opponent. And that I think is, I've always felt like that was really important. I don't feel like I, I've gone in one cases. I feel like other, the other side has oftentimes lost the case um, because they were not quite as prepared. And it's very hard, you know, in, in the real world, running uh, every day, uh, you know, it, it's great. I love to hear um, wise trial attorneys talk about, you know, I can write my closing the day I take the case in, but 
for me, that's never been real life, right? I, I have a lot to do that day and the trial's two years out. And so I, I can't write the closing that day because I have a deposition and I have this and that. So that has never been realistic for me, but to buckle down when the time has come and know every document better than the other person. I think that's, that's been really important. Um, for me, I, you mentioned perseverance. Um, so for me, I lost my first six jury trials. I was having serious doubts. What did I do? I left a, I left a corporate law firm where, which I wasn't happy at, but to come and do this and I wasn't having any success and, but I stuck with it. Right. Um, I didn't have the nerve just to quit, right. And go back to cleaning carpets or something. Six trials. I mean, that was like two years of losing a lot. And, um, and I felt it like I'm the kind of, you talked about competitiveness. I have that. And I don't, I don't like to lose it. It beats me up and, and I don't, I don't forget. And, but then this crazy law system that we have, the case I won, I shouldn't have won. You know, I, I lost the ones I should have won and I won the one I should have lost. And uh, so I, I sort of adopted an attitude that allows for that. But I'm glad I stuck with it. Really glad I stuck with it. Yeah, I imagine you are. <laughs> imagine you are. Now, I remember when I was uh, maybe five years out, I lost 10 jury trials in a row. Ouch. And I just kept talking to myself and, you know, second guessing myself. And I remember when I finally got my acquittal. Uh, it was like an assault case. It was, it was a misdemeanor case. And I, the jury read not guilty and I started crying. And yeah. the client was like, he thought I was happy for him. I was sort of, but I was more relieved for myself. I'm like, I'm not a complete loser. Yes. I, I yeah. I can't remember his name. It was like, camera is Kurt something or another, but. I still remember what it's like to lose so much and, you know, and, and I think that has to be something that every, any kind of business, whether trial or not, like not, you never, it never works out the first several times, you know, you're trying to figure shit out, trying to like learn your craft, whether, you know, now yeah. for me, it's, you know, honestly, it's somewhat, you know, throwing conferences for trial lawyers is, you know, is a lot going on. It's a big challenge and I try to get better every time. And, you know, I never, completely failed, but I've had some that were, you know, early on that I wasn't like terribly successful at, and, you know, and then, you know, doing this, my skills training stuff, you know, I, I did this program Trojan horse method for six years. And then it kind of like, because of the pandemic, and I'm like, I'm dying over here. But then now I got to learn so much during the pandemic from all the great trial lawyers that I have something, you know, I think it works a little bit better now and yeah. better for helping people, you know, get prepared. You know I, I think it, that brings up another thing, if I can mention four characteristics. Um, something that's been important for me is education that you bring up. Um, I still, as you know, I mean, I'm, I have taken every course that I thought would benefit me, and that means several a year for 30 years. Well, that's not true because it didn't used to be several a year. There was only... ATLA in the summer and but now with TLU and lots of other opportunities uh, education is and, and I'm a big believer in that our attorneys in our office uh, it's it's endless it's an open ticket if you want to get it go to an education program but if you don't want to go with one you might be in the wrong office because I think it's super important well it's super important to continue to grow and you know the I heard, I can't remember, I can't remember exactly who said it, but he said, you know, the lawyer who doesn't come to conferences, who doesn't think there's anything more to learn is a lawyer that's in big trouble because this thing we call being a trial lawyer is constantly evolving, constantly new ideas, new arguments, new perspectives, changing times, changing, you know, everything's always changing and we have to be changing too, or, you know, we're going to, or, or you get, you become irrelevant. And plus it's fun to learn. You know, people go to these different conferences and I see these advertisements for them. And all I see is our, our parties and drinks and dancing on the beach. And, and I'm like, what's fun about that? I mean, it's kind of fun, but I think learning and coming up with new ideas to improve your cases, improve your clients' cases. And, you know, be frank, make more money. 
so you can do more stuff that you want to do. To me, that's fun. And then getting to get those people and maybe having a drink or listen, you know, having afterwards when you already have that connection where you had this like epiphanies together of enlightenment that, you know, bring you together. And now you got this second tier. So because you just go to these parties, you don't know anybody because there's nothing connecting you before you get there. That's not fun. You know, when everybody's just standing around, like, you know, like they don't even have the same group for the most part because the people aren't so good sometimes reaching out and they, hey, I'm Dan. Who are you? Like, ah, I'm just here by myself. I can see. But, you know, whatever. And speaking of education, we have this event called TLU New York City at Times Square coming up September 20th to 23rd. And you're going to be teaching there. And so tell us, what have you decided to share with trial boring world in the Big Apple this fall? Um, I'm really lately been focused on establishing connections with jurors. And developing you know a, a deeper kind of contact with them i i can hardly say I, it is a relationship with a juror obviously it's very shallow because we don't talk uh back and forth except for a, a little voir dire but uh through that and and through my interactions i feel like uh, that is one of the most important pieces of a trial um, and those jurors that will work with you in establishing bonds and the ones that won't, you know where you stand there too. And, and I want to talk more about that and, and, and in practical terms, you know, about what I'm doing in my presentation to try to allow them to really hear what I'm saying and process it and understand it and follow it. That's interesting that you say that because, um, you know, I've been trying to figure out this whole trial lawyering thing for a while because I didn't move to California until I was 45 when I decided to become a personal injury lawyer. Well, it's a vastly different skill set than being a criminal offense lawyer. And I mean, vastly different, you know, with all the civil procedure and their discovery and depositions, all that kind of stuff. And I realized real quick that I'm not built for that. It was a little late. You got to start that stuff when you're in your early 20s. You can't yeah. live a different life and then all of a sudden start to learn how to grind this stuff out. Yeah. But, you know, even with, with, with that shortcoming, you know, I've been trying to, you know, that's 45. I'm like, I don't have a lot of time here to, to get to get my groove on. I, and I'm not going to get a mentor because I'm not going to be able to find a mentor because who's going to mentor a 45-year-old who doesn't need them, right? Nobody. And so... I had to go figure it out on my own and attract people towards me that will teach me through teaching others. And I was on my way, I think, figuring out this whole connection thing, trying to biohack the trial lawyer or, you know, figure out what it is that they, that it was. And I started with that, with the Trojan horse program a long time ago, but during the pandemic, I got a chance to study the greatest trial lawyers in the country. The, the Brian Panishes, the Rex Paris's, the Sean Claggett's, the Keith Mitnick's, the Nick Rowley's and, and try to figure out what is the, what is it they're doing or what is it they have or, you know, because they're all so different. And what I had concluded after all, you know, 325 webinars and, and being friends with a lot of them now is that the thing that they focus most on in the entire trial isn't the evidence. It isn't, you know, their arguments. It's their connection with the jury because it starts, it all, it begins and it ends with that connection. With that trust, and I said to Joe Freed, who's a wonderful trial lawyer and a wonderful, you know, just a, one of the best people I know, I said to him, you know, it doesn't matter what you're saying if nobody's listening, if you're not connected. Yeah. Says, you know, Dan, and the inverse is true. It doesn't matter what you're saying if you are connected, because the jury's going to they get they get to decide. They're going to find the information, and they're going to and they're going to want you to win, and they're going to they're going to they're going to make you win. And so it all comes down to connection. And so I'm excited that you're going to be teaching about that because. And how you do it in the context, you know, it's practical application because, you know, I, you know, I, as, you know, we talk about train in the context of, you know, I, I train, can, I think I train connection in the context of voir dire opening and closing, but that's of course in a, in a more sterile environment of a conference room. And when you get into that pressure of a courtroom, well, it changes a bit. I mean, it's, it is, you know, I think the reps help a lot, but obviously, you know, it's like, you know, to me, it's like saying the alphabet, you know, like ABC and then 
when somebody when a cop pulls you over and he wants you to say it, it's like, okay, I'm gonna put a gun in your head. They'll say the alphabet, and you're like, ah, a, a, C, you know, that's kind of because it's a pressure. Pressure affects people, but that's why you got to practice and it get does. used to the pressure, and you know, get up there and get your reps, and you know, and reps are confidence, I think, too, because you know, I've been, I've been, I've been taking golf lessons, and what I realize is that golf and trial learning have a lot in common. What do you think that is, Dave? Practice, practice, practice. That, but actually deliberate practice, like practicing correctly. Like taking a lesson and try to implement what you learn. Of course, you're terrible, like I am. But really, it's that they're mostly confidence games. And when you stand up there, I'm not going to crush this ball down the center. Well, I don't really crush it, but I do hit it more straight. You know what I mean? It like goes 175 yards, whatever else is going 300. But I'm like, it's straight. Reason to celebrate. Just got to keep working it, keep working it. But it's the belief in yourself. And winning begets winning and losing begets losing. And if you can't shake off a loss, you could never be a trial lawyer because you can't handle losing. Doesn't yeah, matter. you have to be able to handle losing. Um, and, you know, the, the names that you've mentioned, they're tremendous charisma, every single one of them. Um, and many, they, they exude that naturally in the, those lawyers that you mentioned are going to command every courtroom that they walk into. And that isn't everybody. And that isn't probably 98% of trial lawyers. Um, and I think, and, and it isn't me, but there's ways to communicate that uh, and to establish that relationship that um, makes a huge difference that anyone can do. And that's what's important, I think, is that any this is accessible to anyone. So when you say this, tell us a little bit more about that or give us a mini preview so we have a little bit more meat on the bones when you say this stuff. Well, I, you know, there is from the beginning th in, in voir dire, um, you know, and in, in Dan, you teach uh, such tremendous uh, sort of practices that are based in, in science, in neurology, um, that can es help establish connection with people. Um, and, and some of these are basic skills that with a little bit of training, you can turn into a practice that's very effective. But also then the content of what you're talking to jurors about and being willing to get permission to get a little more personal with them uh, and to explore exactly where they're at on certain issues that are really important, um, loss and pain and money. Um, so in voir dire, it's, it's the, the interaction, but the interaction then carries in, into the opening statement, right? And, and the same skills are applied, but there's more to it because that's a presentation of your case. And, you know, then you get into more of the tactic of opening and I re and opening to me is the, in my opinion has always been that that is the most important piece of the case, second only to voir dire. And that is, I feel like you win or lose in, in opening. Um, and I've certainly done that. I've won and lost in opening. I watched a video by Jerry Spence when I was a young trial lawyer on opening. And I think he explained in that criminal case that he opened that case for five days. Obviously he knew the judge and, and was able to do that. Um, and his, uh, what he taught in that videotape, VCR videotape, uh, was to get my whole case out there deal with the trouble spots, deal with the holes, all of it. And in, in my openings became much closer to closings, particularly in the defense attorney's eyes. And, you know, when you're, when you're, and, and so using that kind of a method, um, this is a, a preview sort of maybe of what I may talk about there is, is uh, carrying that through the witnesses uh, and then when the defense witnesses come up, you, I feel like you can have a relationship with the jurors that you can have permission, you know, always being courteous, of course, but you can have permission to really dive in with that expert because they know you better than they know that witness. You've been there all week. 
and you you can have permission to um, go just about as far as you want to in a nice way. Anyway, always got to be nice, no matter what. Even if you're yeah, nice. sticking somebody in the side of the neck with a knife cut in their that artery, they bleed out. You do it nicely. Does that hurt? Does that hurt too much, doctor? Here, let me oh, just, you got. Let's just, let's just do it fast. So it your, got a little blood on your shirt. Let yeah. me it off. <laughs> let's, let's do it fast. It won't be as pain, but you'll just bleed out here slowly. It's okay. That's kind of a meta. <laughs> speaking of that. We'll talk about that in a minute for the case. But uh, so now we're talking about some of the different skills. What skills do you think? If you had to pick three skills that you know you believe are important for a great trial lawyer to practice and and, and master. And if they do, they'll become greater. What three skills would you pick? Well, I don't know if this is a skill, um, but if you have trouble with it, you should learn this, this skill. And that is to be yourself. Um, and, and I had a young lawyer come to me once and I had said that. Why don't you be yourself in there? And Because he, he was like, I'm an asshole. And so I don't want to be that guy. Um, well, he didn't say that, <laughs> but he was, he's, and he said, what if I really don't know how to do that? And that was a question that's never occurred to me before, but it makes perfect sense. Um, and, and I think it comes, I don't know how it comes. Some people are very comfortable and other people aren't, and they need to work at that. But I, I think trying to be somebody else isn't the answer. And I think we do that. We can do that. And I'll never be Brian Panish or Keith Mitnick or Nick Rowley or, or Dan Ambrose or Chan Ambrose as much as I want to, I, know. I don't think I can achieve it. Um, and so being Dave it has to be good enough. Um, but I, I, I don't know if that's a skill or not. So I would, I, I would say that's not a skill, not I would a say that's the result of, of, practicing certain skills and habits because I think the ability to be yourself is really the ability to be confident and be calm in whatever you're doing. And calmness and confidence comes from training, I believe. I believe. And because nobody performs, nobody like rises to the occasion. We all low we all sink to our lowest level of practice and competence under pressure. And so I'm gonna have to disagree with that when you're gonna need the three more that doesn't count as well. <laughs> Well, we'll disregard that one. Um, clarity. Um, okay, clarity. In, uh, the skill of being able to hone down into your case and find what is the essence of that case. And that's your case. And communicate, being able to communicate that simply and clearly. Uh, we recently had a trial where there was one photograph that kind of told the story of the whole case. And it was, we put that on a board and it was the story from our point of view as the plaintiff. And what was uh, it a picture of? It was a picture of the store, a store clerk pointing, standing over a, a guy on the floor that was bleeding to death, telling him to get out of the store like this and uh, it came off of the surveillance camera. Um, and we had sued the store because they didn't call 911 to help this guy and he died. Um, very sad case. Anyway, that was a very poignant, clear device um, for communicating our message. So clarity, I think, is really important. All right, that um, counts. So you got one down, two to go. So empathy, for sure, in our business, right? That's, that's at the heart of what we do. Um, and Empathy to the point to where you really take the time to know your client. I'm going to repeat what most people who teach trial lawyer skills say every day. You got to go to their house. You got to spend the time with them. You got to understand their lives uh, in order to tell that story. So empathy is, is a big one. Okay. Um, yeah. Just and so, just so you know, empathy probably closer to character trait or personal quality, but I'm going to let this slide. Oh, you know what? You're right. You're right. So maybe there's really very few skills involved and it, it's about our, you know, being quality, having credibility, having empathy, being that person. And that shines through. Um, I, it is certainly, you hope it can. 
Well, I think um, you probably mentioned one earlier because you're, you're doing a presentation on it, which is connecting. Connecting is a skill. And a lot of people think people are born with it. Some of us aren't. I don't think anybody's born with it. I think people might learn it at a young age because of the environment they're raised in. If they're raised in a very social environment or they have to, they move a lot and they have to deal with a lot of different types of people when they're young and they have to create those relationships so they're not lonely. Or they maybe played high school sports and they had, you know, they, they have camaraderie and, you know, but, but it, I believe connection is a skill. And I think it's the most essential skill to every trial lawyer and when to be worth to practice that. It's huge. I, yeah. You, re, you, reminded, you reminded me that I went to six high schools before I dropped out. You dropped out of high school? Yes. How'd you get to college? Uh, well, I took the GED. So I, I dropped out in my senior year and I took the, um, they have an equivalency exam in California. And I was able to take that before my class graduated. And then I marched on to junior college. Wow. Nice. <laughs> That's a good, but it's great though, because again, every one of those adversities helps develop character. Or you know, you don't really them as adversity at the time because you, know, you chose to drop out, right? So you're like, hey, yes. this is actually a bonus. <laughs> I'm sitting in class for three more months. This is lame as hell. Yeah, and, you know, going to junior college. I never got to go to junior college, so I didn't get the experience of, of the fun of it. But it but, was. You, know what? you can't do everything. No, you can't. You can't. You can always go back, Dan. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So much. <laughs> and so, what, Dave? Let me ask you. So about getting better and you talked about going to, you know, continually learning, but what else are you doing on a daily basis to, to improve your, to improve your own skills in the courtroom, but also your firms. Cause you said you have eight other people that you, you call trial lawyers. So I assume that all eight of these people go to courtrooms to try cases as opposed to being litigators who just, you know, who, who don't try cases, who prepare them, they do depositions, but when it comes day for trial, they're like, Hell no. I'll be right here. If you need a brief rate and you just call me, I'll have it right over to you. Yeah. Um, uh, our trial lawyers are our trial lawyers and everybody there wants to try cases and loves to try cases. Uh, and they range in age, you know, from uh, early 30s to nearly 50. I mean, I'm 50. Yeah. Wow, you got some dinosaurs over there. We've got some that, that uh, you know, have been practicing a long time, and uh, they love to try cases. And that's wonderful in my view because um, I'm so supportive of it. You know what? And we encourage it, and we, we incentivize it. And I don't think we have any... Obviously, you settle a lot of cases. I was going to say, I don't think we have a lot of any settlers... Uh, in the sense that they're afraid, they, they, you know, and, and I love that. Like, you don't fear the crappy case if it's going to get you into court. Just do it, right? I learned, I've learned more from my losses than I have from my wins. That's because uh, you think about them for three months and you can't sleep and you play them over in your mind. Over in your you mind. question about it. How could I have done that differently? That I should have asked that question. That question cost me the whole trial. Or the one ruling, it me it cost me the whole trial but yep. probably not true but we just, when you sit there and you can't sleep at night it just plays over and over yeah. i used to have those night dreams as especially as a criminal defense lawyer like losing a case for a person who i thought was innocent ouch <sighs> oh that yeah. was you know honestly that's, that's why i had to stop doing that stuff because it was so emotionally draining that it was i'm like this is not sustainable yeah but like Thank you you know it's not a sustainable life it's one thing that no. there's a case for somebody's hurt but you asked what uh, what we're doing every day. What are you doing? Um, so education. Um, we are, we do a lot of focus groups, um, and we've gotten to the point where we are putting them on ourselves, um, and you know, bringing in jurors from the community. And you can do a whole lot of them. It's not hard, and you can test a lot of issues. You can try your opening. You can voir dire your case. Just keep bringing the jurors through, um, and it's a. It, it doesn't have to cost ten thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars. Although you get a great product from some specialists if you do that. I'm I not, I've done it, and I continue to do it. But we also uh, uh, do it kind of down and dirty. Um, 
I am embarking on a project where we're going to bring a group in of jurors once a month uh, for the lawyers to voir dire, practice that voir dire. You know, it's the most important piece of the trial, and it's the one that we don't, pr you know, you've only done the same number of voir dires as you've had trials, you know, and if, you know, if you've tried 25 trials, you've only done that 25 times. And so I, a lot of, a lot of lawyers don't do it very often. And you can tell, uh, right. and, and do not use it in, in nearly to the extent that it, it can be used. So we're going to bring a group in once a month and we are doing that. And, um, and then we're taking education. We're taking boot camp right now. So it's exciting. Let's just say, um, yeah, when you do those focus groups, you make sure you record them and in case we can zoom and kind of review it. Cause like, I'd like to see what you're doing and, you know, perhaps, you know, offer my feedback on it. So that yeah. way get some exponential learning. Cause it's, you know, it's one thing to do it, but it's another thing to get some feedback, some different perspectives and some coaching on it too. Cause that's how you get, I think you go from like, you know, most people's growth curves like that, but with right training and stuff, they can go like this and it woof, woof. Oh, absolutely. Woof. And where it's like this, you know, cause that's what I want for people that I work with. I'm like, shit, I ain't got 20 years to, to get to greatness. And nobody wants to wait 20 years to get to greatness. If, especially if you don't have to. If you have to, that's a different story. But if you don't have to, why would you wait? That's crazy. All those people are going to have to suffer injustice because you're waiting because you don't want to push yourself. That's who you are. Great. But you're probably not. We, we are probably not getting along if somebody is of that nature. Probably <laughs> not going to get along. It, it is. And it's so great to watch uh, as well. It, it's, it's fun to do. I think I, I do have fun with it. Um, but videotaping is super important, right? And, and you want to have a videotape of the jury and then you want to have a camera on yourself or, or the person that your lawyer that's doing it, um, for feedback. Right. And, and the cameras are cheap. They're 200 bucks. Um, I learned that from Dan Ambrose and, you know, it's exciting. I want, you know, uh, Dustin Hoff in my office, um, uh, he, what did he go to? He went to a TLU conference, I think. And no, he went to my boot camp, my workshop he, in Vegas. Well, he went to your boot camp. Uh, and just before that, he had been at something where Nick Raleigh uh, was teaching. And, and he, he watched Nick do the suitcase closing. Uh, and Dustin came back. He tried this unwinnable case. And he did the suitcase closing. And, you know... Not only did he win, he won like $300,000 uh, from a dentist that slapped a child's hand. And, and it was just amazing. He was like, I did everything I learned at this conference and we won this great recovery. So, it, no, it's so exciting though to yeah. see people take stuff. It was probably, it was at probably TLU 2021. Yeah. Where you watched that. But also, Nick Raleigh's best that I thought ever saw him do the briefcase closing was on this recent medical malpractice trial. I think he did it in Iowa. It's on CBN. He got like 25 million. He asked for 25 million. He got like 27. It was the best uh, money argument that I can ever remember seeing. So, and it's so great when you see that argument because like some people are like, oh, that's a trite, an argument. But it's only trite to you because you've heard it before. The jury, they never heard that argument before. Like, oh, that's good. I like yeah. that. I'm connected to that. And, you know, and people are like, oh, you know, using other people's stuff. Of course, we all use other people's stuff. You just got to repeat it enough and practice it enough that it's part of you. And, yeah. Because, you know, like, I don't think anybody can be anybody else. You know, when I teach people, you know, to help people learn voir dires, I tell them, you know, look, this is my best stuff. You know, this is, this is rhetorically, I think it's great. But if you don't like it, throw it away. I don't care. I'm just trying to teach you the eye contact, the facial expression control, the hand movement, the yeah. voice control, the, you know, those kinds of basic skills that you have to practice over and over and over and over order to be able to do them without thinking in order to be part of, you know, and, you know, I read this book peak and I've read it many, many times. And it talks about, it's the science of high achievement, high performance. And one thing he talks about is, you know, first of all, you know, solitary practice, you know, doing the practice while you're yeah. alone. You know what I mean? Nobody's like, think about how many hours Michael Jordan or, or Kobe Bryant were in that gym by themselves at four 30 in the morning mm -hmm. by themselves, or maybe with their coach free throws, dribbling alone. 
because it's who they were. And as trial lawyers, you know, I mean, there's so much practice or study we have to do by ourselves, you know, and the people that do my boot camps and stuff, I'm like, you got to practice. You got to practice on your own. Here, it's this jury foam core boards because you're not going to be able to get, you're not going to be able to get a focus group every day, but you got this focus group. You don't have to pay. And they're real faces. And, it, you know, when I practice, when I get ready for court, I'm practicing in front of my focus by, by boards because I got somebody to look at. And, you know, it's the discipline to do that, that independent practice. But it's also, you know, in the, in the professions that we're in, we're not professional athletes. Professional athletes, athletes have the advantage. Uh, they only have to perform 10% of the time, 5% of the time. The other 90%, they're practicing. They're going to practice every day, you know, and maybe only play one or two games a week. Well, we're, we're working every day. We don't get to practice every day. So if we want to get to greatness, we got to figure out how to, how to practice while we live. You know, we practice, you know, making eye contact with somebody before you're talking to them. Practice, you know, the clerk at the, at the store or at the counter or at the area. You know, somebody has a, sh a, you know, what I would can say a difficult job, a difficult life, who's never going to have financial freedom, a future. To try to, when you talk to that person, Try to activate the mirror neurons in their face and talk to them and have a warm face. No matter what you're saying, if you're saying, you know, can you tell me what aisle the cereal's on? But you're pushing, you're just trying to get them to smile at you. And, you know, occasionally, maybe half the time, I'm, I'm successful in the at 30, at 10 or 30 second interaction. I'm like, yes, I got to smile. Or, you know, <laughs> practicing moving your hand between you and the person you're talking to and practicing moving with the rhythm of your voice. It takes a lot of practice. But when you do, it changes everything. So all these skills that you just practice every day, then when you you know when you when you're up performing, it's like you're not thinking about them because you you just forty hours this week, and so we just got to continue to practice if we want to be, you know, world class. And if somebody doesn't be world class, it's hard to get along with those people because I'm like I just don't get it. It's like somebody's not competitive that's playing a game like they don't care if they win. They totally don't care if they win or lose. I mean, it's one thing to cry if you lose or break rackets and throw tantrums, but it's another thing to be like, oh. I had the same amount of fun as I did winning, winning as a losing. I'm like, that's weird. I don't get it. Well, I, 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 have, I have a good friend and she's a very successful trial lawyer. Uh, but her attitude in life is, uh, and she makes the deal with her opposing counsel. Whoever has the most fun wins this case. Well, that's an interesting perspective. I don't know if I'd go. I, I don't know if I agree with that. It's like whoever gets the verdict wins the case, but that's the most that's fun. That's old school. That's the most fun though, right? That's the most fun. You get all the fun you want until you get a, you know, if the case, the case goes against you. <laughs> and that's, I don't know too many people, it better, it better not be fun or you're in the wrong business. You're in the wrong business. Wrong business. Yeah. Wrong. But speaking about fun, even though you recently worked on a very, you know, your last verdict was a very tragic case. And. You know, so tell us about that case because I know a little bit about it because you gave me the privilege of helping you work on it for a couple of days, yeah. and and uh, and it was a it was a really an interesting case. I mean, an interesting cause of action you mentioned a little bit earlier, but just tell us a little bit about the story of that case. Yeah, so in that case, we represented it. it was a wrongful death case. We represented uh, a young man. He was thirty one years old, schizophrenic, lived lived in a town next to Ann Arbor goes to the store, you know, the gas station convenience store one morning, and it's early. It's not even 5 a.m. yet. Uh, and he's confronted by a couple of kind of crackhead people uh, in the parking lot. And they get into some kind of argument. And one of them takes, she takes a box cutter and she stabs him in the arm, in the bicep. And there's a, the brachial artery is right there. She severed that artery in that vein. So he's bleeding profusely. Uh, run, he walks, he doesn't run. He goes into the store seeking help and he's getting tired, he's bleeding and he lays down. And the underage clerk, 17 years old, uh, orders him out of the store because he's bleeding all over the place. And the, our client staggered right out and laid down right outside the front door. Well, he's laying there People are coming and stepping around him and going into this store and making their purchases and then leaving, you know, three different sets of customers come in. The clerk is coming out and he has his, his phone and he's 17. He's taking video of this guy. Posting it on Instagram. I'm having a really interesting night. Look at this guy I just met. Yeah. It's like a snuff film. Uh, 
we were not able to get the video, unfortunately, but we know he was taking it. Uh, anyway, he waits 10 minutes to call 911. Um, unfortunately, about the time he was making that call, our client died. Uh, so it was our job to prove that the delay, that, that he could have been saved if he had called 911 right away. Um, the, the person that accosted him and stabbed him, she's in prison. So she, her justice had been dealt. So we sued the gas station company, the owner, uh, over this failure to call 911. Negligent supervision, negligent training, and just the straight old negligence uh, of the young man attributable to the company. Is there a statute in Michigan that, you know, relates to this? There's not a, well, there's a couple statutes about uh, minors working, which they were violating. He wasn't supposed to even be there. He was supposed to be supervised. He wasn't supervised. So the kid didn't even know what to do. I, I do believe that. Um, plus, I think he had a hard heart as well. Um, there is case law in Michigan that says a merchant, and that, that case is a gas station. Uh, if there's a crime that happens and someone's in danger, they have a duty to to call police to expedite the police coming there. So uh, when he walked in the store, he said that he'd been stabbed. He's bleeding to death. And that uh, should have triggered the duty. Should have triggered the duty. You bet. And we were able to take some uh, dash cam from the police cars that responded to the call. Uh, and we t were able to take the dash cam from the police department, the footage all the way to the gas station. And it, that took 75 seconds for them to get there. So they clearly could have got there had they been called. So what would you say the, the, the three, you know, we're always learning, right? Always learning. Every time you try a case, learn. I mean, decisions you made that maybe didn't quite work out, you know, maybe interactions with the jury that you, you know, were like, wow, I didn't expect that one. Cause I, I mean, I remember one time I was trying this case, the case that we use as a vehicle to train yeah. and my client was gay and I'm by during the jury in front of judge, what's his name? Um, I like this guy anyways. I'm, and, and I asked this juror about gay people and who, you know, has, you know, like my mom, like, you know, basically disowned my sister for being gay, but I guess feelings against him, whatever. And this guy was like, I do. I'm like, okay, tell me about it. He's like, well, I'm gay. And, you know, people like your client, they give gay men a bad name. All, Cause it's, you know, the rest stops and stuff like that. And, you know, and I'm like, wow. I'm like, wasn't expecting that one. I was like, so you're saying you might not be a good juror in this case. He's like, no, I think I might be a price against your client. And I was like, well, I I'm glad I asked. I wouldn't have known, but that was like early in the void year. Cause I'm like, this is crazy. So we're like five minutes in, maybe 10 minutes into it. I said, you know what, why don't you take a listen to the rest of the stuff that we're going to be talking about and chime in when you feel like it. And at the end of this Wadir, let us know if you still feel the same way. If you're still thinking this isn't the right case for you and that way, of, you know, you won't have to sit on it. But, you know, because there's still a lot to go here. He's like, fair enough. But it turned out not to be the right case for him. So did you have any challenges any, 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 any in, in the Wadir that threw you off at all? Well, um, I had one self-created one and then uh, some others that were interesting. I made the mistake with an individual that I, I believe was probably transgender and and I referred to a her as a him and that was totally unconscious and stupid and embarrassing and I found another reason to get that person off for cause. I didn't want anybody to harbor any, any a grievance against me. Um, and that person who was uh, was a statistician at the University of Michigan, and uh, she thought that in a case where we are asking for many millions of dollars, that the burden of proof should be about 70 percent. And so that that was her ticket off the jury. There, there was a psychiatrist on this jury um, and our client was schizophrenic. And I didn't know if that was good or bad, but the psychiatrist told me straight out that uh, the other side has a head start on me in this case. 
he he has a bias, and we talked a lot about bias. And um, he he just was very you know. And I asked for a cause, uh, you know, for him to be dismissed, and it was the one that the judge did not agree with me on, and kept him on. And I don't know why the judge did that, but it turned out fine. So oh, you use a preemptor on him? I didn't. There were actually a couple of worse jurors that I needed to to use those on. Um, so I, I wasn't that afraid of the doctor, but uh, when he said that, obviously it's very concerning, and I wanted to. <laughs> you know, it turned out just fine. So what do I know? You said it turned out just fine. Yeah. What was the offer on the case? No offer. No Never. offer at all. Never made an offer. They made it. They made it easy. easy on us. Yeah. And so what was the verdict? The verdict totaled nine and a half million. Well, that's a good. That's a good ways from zero. That's a good way from zero. And yeah. This, and what did you ask the jury for? Uh, probably 13. Not bad. 70%. Yeah. And so what was your money? Ar- what was your money argument? I mean, was it the briefcase? Was it the picture? Was it any of those things? Or was you just saying, hey, this is $13 million. I don't need to justify it. It's just because I say so. My name is Steve Christensen. Uh, no, I didn't do it that way. I did use the picture. I did actually use the briefcase in rebuttal. Um, and we had the nicest family. Um, our, the grandparents and the parents were just the nicest, warmest people that you just love them, right? And they'd suffered a terrible loss. And so, you know, I, I did make money suggestions. Um, and I asked, I think, for $8 million for conscious pain and suffering for 10 minutes, and they gave him four, which I, I was good. Good hourly really rate. Because they, they gave a little more than I asked for in the loss of society and companionship for the family. So, um, you know, they took away a little. They gave a, ex, a little extra. Uh, just uh, really, uh, we didn't have any idea what was going to happen. It's a unique case. Um, and uh, I'm always afraid uh, that it, uh, they're going to say zero. I, I'm really? 100% of the time, I ex- I kind of expect that as a self-protective mechanism. I'm sure you're not alone with those fears yeah. and those concerns. Yeah. The What would you say, you know, but the, the things that you learned, you know, those are something that happened. What, like, what, like, takeaways, lessons that you're like, I'm going to apply that in my next case because I hadn't really recognized it or realized that before this, whatever argument issue, whatever this thing happened, but the, I'm going to be a better trial lawyer when I have this in part of my, my, uh, in my briefcase. One thing that I consciously did that I've never thought, even thought about before uh, was slowing down everything. The, everything that I'm saying, slowing down my presentation, slowing, and not to put them to sleep, but no. so they can follow what the hell I'm saying. And I never knew it but uh, before. But probably half the words I've said to juries over my entire life, no, nobody ever heard because it was just going too fast. And, and we know our case. We, we think that, you know, we think in shorthand for very complex terms, for very complex concepts. And we kind of expect people to follow along with us. And I've been as guilty as that as anybody. And I consciously now, I, and I have to confess, I learned this in TLU boot camp, um, that I slowed down about forty percent, and it was interesting because some of the other chambers in the the courtroom were sort of listening to this trial in the background on their system. They can do that in their video system, and and I heard from two different people uh, that work in the courthouse that they appreciated how slow the delivery was because they could follow what I'm saying. They understood what I'm saying. And it wasn't just a bunch of words being blasted past them. So I'm going to, I'm going to slow it down. Dave, I want you to know that's some of the most exciting news I've heard today because you know, when we were practicing, it's one of the things we practice is practicing deliberately, I just say speak 10% slower just to get that deliberately because we have to train ourselves. If we don't train ourselves in practice 
to do the things that we want to do in performance. We're never going to do it performance because that stress and that pressure of the courtroom is just way too much if you don't practice before you get there. So the fact, this is the first time you told me about the slowing down part because, you know, whenever, whenever everybody gets a verdict that I have anything to do with, of course, I like to take as, as much credit as possible as I can. Mm -hmm. And just because I'm, you know, self, you know, whatever the problems I have to, to. It's enjoy. all yours. It's, this is all yours, baby. That's what my friend said. He said, you get all the credit you want. Just give me the money. <laughs> I'll keep the money. You take the credit. I'm like, deal, man. That's a bargain. That's a bargain. Okay. Slowing down. That's a really good one. I'm, you know, I mean, that's one that, cause I always compare it to audio books. You know, when you listen to an audio book, they speak so slowly, they pause so frequently that, you know, if you really kind of like, wow, that's slow, but think about it. It's ver ver verb words or verbal is the only vehicle they have to teach you. And if you don't learn from it, it's a waste of time. And so they have to give your mind that space and that slowness and all those pausing to create that space to process the information yeah. and keep the mind relaxed. So slowing down, what else? Um, I, I wasn't afraid to use emotion in this case. I'm typically, I'm pretty darn laid back guy, right? Probably to a fall, right? It, and, and I'm that way in court and, and it's me, but, um, I had no trouble raising emotion in this case, but in, in using it, um, and because this was a highly charged, you know, if somebody sprained their ankle or something, it's not <laughs> happened, but this was a pretty charged situation and we had a pretty callous gas station owner. Um, oh, yeah. so it, it, it was easy. It was easy really to, to get that and just use it. And, and you know what, I, I get choked up, you know, I start to tear up in, in this case and, you know, but I didn't mind it, it you know, cause hundred percent genuine and others in the courtroom were doing the same thing. So, uh, being able to just to let go and be involved emotionally, I think is, it's really good. I'm not afraid to do that. And the third thing, if you have a third thing. Well, I don't know. Um, I always want to, I always wish I asked for more. I'm not sure if we live and learn and, and, but I, I know the ask is really important, but in this case, because of the focus groups, um, if we ask too much, it just got disregarded. You know, they didn't talk about it in their deliberations. They picked their own numbers when I asked for 25 million on this case. So I, you know, we, we engineered I, the best we could. Um, I am not, I don't say that because I'm disappointed. It was more than I thought we would get on this case. So, no, it's a great verdict. And speaking of a great verdict, we are going to do a case analysis on that, which is a breakdown. And what's especially exciting about this trial is that it was in a high def video courtroom. So, we have great videos of the voir dire and opening the whole trial. So, we're going to be able to do, you know, more than one program. So, so we're going to be doing a case analysis on Trial Lawyers University on July 24th, starting at 10 a.m. Eastern, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. It'll probably be a two to three hour program. And we're going to go through actual video clips of the voir dire and the opening statement. So some of these challenges and some of these things that went on in voir dire. And then Dave, because Dave's going to be engaged in more learning because that's the most valuable thing is to do something at your highest level, to give it your best, and then to watch yourself and give yourself feedback and maybe get feedback from, you know, you know, an outside person, a coach like myself or somebody else to cause, you know, maybe to think about it a little bit more. And that way, again, exponential growth and same thing with the opening statement. So I am, you know, really stoked and glad that, you know, cause the advent of more videos, cause I used to have, used to, have to only rely on court review network, which has been a great partner in trial lawyers university. And if you don't have it, I highly suggest that you do get it because you can learn a lot. I think you use the promo code BCA50 to get half off on it. And, you know, and all the programs, we, you know, that we've done, though, you know, these live programs in Huntington Beach and Vegas, and everything are all on TLU on demand, too, which is an app now, too. So it's a great resource too. for continued learning. All these things continue learning. And I'm looking forward to coming back to Detroit, my hometown. And we're going to do a, you know, we're going to do this boot camp workshop with Dave and his firm and some other local trial lawyers from, 
from around, you know, southeast, you know, southeast Michigan, Detroit for, you know, from July 31st to August 2nd. So if anybody's local there and wants to come and sit in and be a juror or join us for lunch or dinner, because we'll be going out every night, you are welcome to. You can just contact me, either email Dan at Trial Lawyers University or call me on my cell or text me 248-808-3130 and we'll make a spot for you because it's going to be great fun and great learning. Dan, thanks so time. much for being here. I uh, Thank you. I'm glad we got to spend this time together and I will see you soon. Okay, thanks, Dan. Join us September 20th to 23rd in New York City for TLU Live. We're going to have some of the greatest trial lawyers in the country coming from Brian Panish, Ben Morelli, Judy Livingston, Joe Freed, Zoe Littlepage, Rex Paris, and the list goes on and on. And not only will we have four lecture tracks, but we're going to have seven workshop tracks where you can work on and hone a specific skill in a small group taught by a great trial lawyer. The website is TLUNYC.com. Ready to train with the Titans and set records with your verdicts? Register for our live conferences and boot camps at TrialLawyersUniversity.com. Start getting your reps in before the big event by going to TLUOnDemand.com to gain instant access to live lectures, case analysis, and skills training videos from the trial lawyer champions you love and respect, as well as pleadings, transcripts, PowerPoints, and notes for a roadmap to victory. Join the group that continues to get extraordinary results. Trial Lawyers University, produced and powered by LawPods.